Most people think 3D printers are just for plastic toys like this. I'm gonna show you how to take a 3D print and turn it into solid metal like this using sand casting. It's easier than you think and you can do it in your own home on a limited budget. First up, what to cast. I'm casting a Maker Coin. I haven't heard much about these lately, but I think they need to make a comeback. They're kind of like a calling card or a business card for makers, but with no information on them at all. The techniques needed to make one of these will work for anything small. Car badges, cufflinks, small metal components, that kind of thing. I'm using a 3D print as a pattern. A pattern is the thing you wanna make a copy of. Think of it like a master. With sand casting, one pattern can make a whole bunch of parts. The pattern is not destroyed by the process. I designed this in the free version of Blender. I put my little channel logo on there. It was a coin, but I added little gear teeth. No real reason, I just think it'll look cool in metal. Not everything that can be printed can be sand cast, not easily anyway, um, but a good rule of thumb is called draft. The draft will allow you to pull this out of the sand without disrupting the sand. There are ways to get around that, but it's a good general rule. You gotta learn the rules before you learn how to break them, right? I printed this on a Prusa Mark II, old ancient Prusa Mark II with standard yellow PLA that I had laying around. You don't need special filament or a special printer to do this. If you're interested, I printed in 0.1 millimeter layer heights and I turned ironing on. I generally don't do that, but I just kind of felt like trying it. Higher quality settings aren't required, but they can help. You will never get a better part than your pattern anyway. Layer lines on the sides, that can cause issues, especially removing it from the sand, and you can sand those off. The geometry of this part makes that kind of impossible. So I went with the second best option, which is a very thick coat of Rust-Oleum Gloss Clear. In the past, I've used 3D printed patterns without any prep at all, and I've largely gotten away with it. Um, but a little bit of prep sometimes goes a long way. This little coin fits perfectly inside this small iron flask. You can get these online. I'll show you where to find all this stuff at the end of the video, so just hang on. The white powder you see is talc. Old school talc baby powder. You can't really get talc anymore, um, but you can get parting powders, just normal foundry sand parting powders. Just make sure it's silica free, non-silica parting powder, especially if you plan on using your lungs for the rest of your life. And then there's the sand. This is the sand part of the sand casting. This red sand is called Petrobond. It's oil bonded, it's sticky, and I love it. Oil bonded means you don't have to worry about moisture. It holds its shape really well. It vents air really well. It's really good stuff. Sometimes it pays to just buy good materials. As much as I love making things, and I definitely do, there are times when spending a little bit of money can save you a lot of time and frustration and money. Ask yourself, do you want to make things in metal, start making things in metal right away, or do you want to spend a lot of time making sand first? Plus, you need something called a muller to make green sand, and those cost a lot more than 10 pounds of Petrobond. Ramming up the sand is the kind of thing that definitely takes some practice, and there's a feel to getting it rammed tight enough. Petrobond is actually really forgiving in general because it's so sticky. You know, if you don't ram it hard enough, it, it will stick together. If you ram it too hard, it'll still let air pass through it. If you mess this step up, you can cause all sorts of problems, or you might say learning opportunities. Now the purpose of the sand is to take the shape of the pattern and also hold that shape when the pattern is removed and when metal is poured in. I couldn't tell you how many times I've rammed up a pattern and when I picked up the flask, the sand just fell right out of there. That's a bigger problem with like larger flasks and it's definitely more of a problem if you're not used to ramming it tight enough. Uh, like when you're just starting out, you haven't got the feel for it. It's not a big deal. You can just ram it up again. It's not like the sand disappears. Now you don't just need a pattern and the sand. You need a way for the metal to get into the cavity left by the pattern. That's called gating. And it's a major reason why you will succeed or fail when casting. There are many different types of gating. It depends on what you're doing, what you're casting. The goal is to get the part filled with metal and nothing else. No air, no sand, no crud just clean metal. A flask this small kind of limits how crazy you can get with it, but I tend to like forming the gates with something like the, the piece of copper pipe here that I've bent or printed patterns that can form the gating. Some people cut the gates, the passageways with a spoon. The real test is how good does the part look at the end? If it's full of holes or it looks like it's full of like, like sand and metal soup, you probably screwed up the gating somehow. The metal you use is also important. Not all metal alloys are designed for casting. Some are for forging, some are for extrusions, some are for being rolled out into sheets. There are alloys for everything. A good rule of thumb is to use a metal that is meant for casting, either buying the right alloy or melting down scrap from a part that was already cast. So cans, aluminum cans for example, those are not cast, those are drawn into can shapes. So don't melt that and cast with that metal. You can, you can try, but it's, it's gonna cause some problems. Here I'm using an alloy called ZA12. 
It's a zinc and aluminum alloy used in casting, including gravity fed sand casting, some die casting. It's pretty tough. It melts at a pretty low temperature. It's easy to work with. It's inexpensive and it's sold in small enough ingots to fit inside the crucibles for these electric furnaces. An electric furnace, by the way, is a great way to melt metal. It's not very big or fast and you don't want to melt down scrap metal into ingots with one, but you get really good temperature control and that's very important. If you pour too cold, the metal won't fill the mold all the way before it starts solidifying. It'll cool off too quick. If you pour too hot, you can run into other problems like a, a bad surface finish or flashing or something called hot tearing. It, it can crack when it cools. But these electric furnaces allow you really to dial in an exact temperature. With ZA12, I shoot for 500 Celsius to start. Especially a part like this where it's kind of got a large surface area but it's very thin. You don't want to pour too cold. In short, get a metal alloy that's designed for casting, pour it at the right temperature, and get clean metal. Even the right kind of metal isn't gonna work if it's contaminated full of other junk. The pouring process makes people nervous sometimes. You are almost literally playing with liquid fire. It's liquid molten metal. To make matters worse, you gotta pour kind of quickly. You don't want starting and stopping. Commit, concentrate, finish the pour, and wear leather gloves. I've been doing this for years, and I can say I have never been injured or burned while metal casting. That's largely because I'm careful, I wear protective equipment. I don't take anything for granted when I'm pouring molten metal. I have been burned uh, welding a few times. Got cut woodworking. I've had pottery explode in the kilns back there. Be careful with any maker skill folks. None of them are super safe. Just don't let your guard down and keep a fire extinguisher handy. There's one right there. You can see on my wall. It goes without saying, uh, after you're done pouring, let everything cool for a while. I generally let things cool overnight, or if it's small like this, I give it three, four hours. Opening the flask, this is always kind of like Christmas morning. You know, did Santa give you a nice clean casting or a partially filled lump of black coal looking crap? Actually, coal would be a great gift for a blacksmith. So if you're into that, here's a close up shot of it straight from the sand. I don't believe in hiding my mistakes behind like distant shots or bad focus and then like grinding them away and hope no one notices. This isn't a perfect casting for a number of reasons, but it's definitely good enough for today. There isn't even excessive flashing or to remove or anything like that. I'm pretty happy with this. When it comes to finishing, you can finish this like any other metal part because that's exactly what it is. It's solid metal now. It's not painted like metal. It's not plated in metal. It's solid all the way through. It's perfect for like powder coating, laser engraving, throwing at people you don't like, or polishing, which is what I'm gonna do. Now, when you have a raised surface and a lower surface like this, uh, you have some options. If you use any large sanding tools, you tend to hit all the raised surfaces and the lower areas are left untouched. If you wanna polish up in there, you need some small bits for a Dremel or some kind of tool like that and the uh, patience of a jeweler. Or if you're like me, you like the contrast of the raised and lowered spots looking a little bit different. So I'm just gonna clean up the raised surface and leave that sand texture underneath. You can see my reflection in it. Or if you want even more contrast, you can paint it. Paint the part first and then do the sanding. You'll sand the raised surfaces clean and the lower surfaces will stay painted a color. That gives you a much more stark contrast, kind of like I did with these game tokens. I cast these, these weren't sand cast, but they were cast in metal. I painted them, I sanded them, and you get a nice color versus shiny metal contrast. When finishing anything, it's, it's really important to take your time and don't try to rush the grits, start with 220 and then 320 and then 400 um, and, and kind of take your time. If you try to rush through it, you'll end up having to go right back down anyway to get rid of like one or two really deep scratches that you just can't get with the 600 grit. And just remember power tools are really great at ruining your projects more quickly. Take your time. It's not worth a rush. Often, I don't do any of this actually because I like the sand texture. If you use good sand like Petrobond, you do your gating right, your temperature right, you do a few other things. Uh, the sand texture will end up looking pretty nice. It'll be consistent, it'll be subtle. If your part ends up looking kind of like a popcorn ceiling or Swiss cheese, you did something wrong. Sometimes also the surface can look really nice on a part, but then when you machine it, if you machine your, your castings, it'll reveal big holes and bubbles and stuff. That's often also a gating problem or a design problem. Uh, but really, there's no reason why you can't make a casting in your garage that looks good even without finishing. You can do it. It just takes some technique and some care. So I told you earlier, I would tell you exactly where to find all of this stuff, the equipment and all that. 
and I wasn't lying. If you want to try this for yourself, I put together a maker's sand casting guide. It includes where to find the exact flask that I used here, the rest of the tools, and a quick instruction guide just with a few points to keep in mind. It also includes the STL file for this, this coin that you might want to try casting yourself, and a couple other things like the sand rammer that you saw me using which by the way is also a pattern and you can cast one of those in metal as well. And some other stuff. Just check it out. It's free. You got nothing to lose. The link is below. I'll email it straight to your inbox. Thanks for watching. See you next time.